Belgium. Sorry if you pronounce the uh, name of the city wrongly. Yeah, he is a most eminent solar specialist. I am very glad to uh, welcome him for our meeting. And this session is going to be on the very focused session. It's going to be only on proximal humerus fracture. It's only on the complex ones, not on the routine bit that we see. We are only going to talk about four part fractures, dislocation, and liver shoulder replacement, and all this stuff. It's a focused theme. And uh, we have divided into like uh, two separate talks. One talk, first talk is going to be given by me, where I'm just going to tell about uh, an overview of the complex fractures by showing few case examples. And then uh, Toon Van Roebuck will tell about uh, uh, what is his way of managing all these uh, complex proximal numerous fractures, mainly focusing on the reverse shoulders. Because in Europe, they have very high volume. Especially in Belgium, they have very high volume of these patients and uh, their outcome has always been phenomenal. We, were, we would like to know how they get that and uh, all their tips and tricks we would like to know. That's why he has been invited today. So let us start with my talk first. And uh, I'm going to tell about a uh, few things about uh, complex proximal humerus fracture. Because some of the it will be seen with postgraduates, I'm going to tell some few basic things also. My talk is going to be like, uh, at the end, I'll be telling some few points, five or six points, which you need to look into in all proximal humerus fractures to get better outcome. So first thing is we know these three or four part fractures and fracture dislocation form only about 20% of proximal humerus fractures. So totally 5% of fractures of all fractures in our body is proximal humerus fractures. Out of which only 20 to 23% are four part fractures and other complex fractures. And two third fracture occur in women. There is increased incidence in osteoporotic patients. The main concerns whether you manage operatively or non operatively is non union, avian, malunion, and secondary problems like stiffness, degeneration, impingement, or nerve damage. So, how to avoid this? If you look into the literature about four part proximal humerus fractures, we should look into the conservative management. The functional results tend to be very poor in terms of constant score improving only from 47 to 62. But if you do surgical management, will it bring better outcome? And there are a lot of controversies about it. We know about proper trial where it has shown not, not shown much difference. But all depends on what variables that you are looking into. So what variables tend to bring better outcome? That's what I'm going to tell in the in this talk. If you look into the classification of proximal humerus fractures, we know there are several classifications like Yeo classification, which shows uh, those which are having like uh, uh, fracture dislocations. Articular fracture involvement or uh, uh, tuberosity displacement, they come into the severe varieties. Similarly, if you go into the Habermeyer classification, again, if you see the fracture dislocation, they come into the severe varieties. And if you go into the Hertel classification, that's, this classification is mainly intended to identify which patient will go in for Evers necrosis. If you look into the situation like where they have glenohumeral humor dislocation, where there is head split components, where there is severe angle displacement of the head and they have high chance of going into avascular necrosis. So they are predictors of ischemia. If you go into the near classification, this is a commonest classification that we all go through, Charles near classification. And here we have like uh, four varieties, one for one part, two part, three part, four part, but the main thing is whether they are displaced more than one centimeter and angulated more than 45 degree. And displacement of more than one centimeter is the original figure given by near, but after that, there are CT scans that have shown even more than half centimeter displacement is also very important. So nowadays what we follow is more than half centimeter displacement and more than 45 degree angulation. So here if you see the fracture dislocation is the most severe variety. There is anterior dislocation or posterior dislocation. They, are, they form the most severe variety and they bring the poorer outcomes. So what to look when you are seeing an X-ray with a, a complex proximal humerus fracture? First thing you look is fracture location in the neck. Whether it's a surgical neck fracture or anatomical neck fracture. Anatomical neck fractures tend to do poorer because the vascularity is much impeded over there. And then look for tuberosities. I think we all tell about displacement and displacement. What I need to look at is whether it is comminuted or not, whether it is reconstructable or not. Some of the tuberosity fractures are there, but they may not, they may not be displaced, but they are totally comminuted. If they are comminuted, then you cannot reconsider it at all. They are also something that you need to look into. And if it is a dislocation, there are situations like acute dislocation, chronic dislocation. There are IT, we come across situations like a lot of neglected cases where you have neglected dislocations and neglected factor dislocation. And I look into the metaphysical medial hinge. 
that is very important for stability. If the medial hinge is not there, then they tend to go into varus reduction and they go into malunion and nonunion also. And uh, head split fragments. Head split means there is lack of vasculite at one point. So they are going to have a supposedly either nonunion or malunion. So, consider treatment, which one we can choose only in those minimally displaced fracture, poor surgical candidates and low demand patients, then there is no controversy about it, you're just going for uh, con uh, conservative management. But we think about kind of operative treatment only in those patients where there is displaced fracture, comminuted fracture, and angulated fracture, this is where, where you are thinking about operative treatment. So, what variable should look into to bring better outcome? That's the next thing to look into. I'm going to show few case examples and each group of case examples will try to show one point what you should look into. So first case is a very, very simple case. A 59 year old chap, active person, had a fall and sustained this fracture. Here you can see that uh, the fracture of the graded tuberosity with the fracture of the humeral head articular surface and there is subtle head split is also there. There is slightly insecure medial hinge. There is minimal varus still and head split is also there. Obviously, I chose for non-operative management only and anyone will agree with that. And two weeks follow-up is totally fine, no problems. And six weeks follow-up is also, there is a, maybe a slight tilting in the varus. And, uh, and ten weeks follow-up, the fracture is going to union and it is united but it is slightly united in the varus molecule. Patient not having any big trouble now. But later on, he can have problems with the greater tuberosity impingement. The patient doesn't want surgery. But what I try to emphasize it, why is slight malunion? It's because there is medial hinge is a problem. And head split is a, when there is head split, there is a relative loss of vascularity and there is some, some resorption of bone and slight virus that has occurred. So first important thing, another patient like you see here, I only operated this patient some two years ago. That time he was having a four-part fracture where we managed to fix it nicely. But he went into slight varus malunion. That medial hinge was not there, but he united. But he's not having any big trouble. But his problem is after two years, he's coming to see me with the impingement type of pain due to the second impingement, due to the slight malunion, and the, the subocromial space is reduced. So he's getting impingement. He's not, in, he's not having surgery. Now he doesn't want surgery, but he's, uh, he was sent for physiotherapy, he thought better. But what I'm trying to emphasize is first point is varus is a potential for problem. Never ever think, always see whether you are able to get the fracture in the reduction neutral or in valgus. Never to go in virus. If it is going in virus, they are going to have a potential for problem. That's the first point one should think about. Next, look into this fracture. This guy presented to me with a radar tuberosity fracture and anterior dislocation. When you see a fracture, just a GT fracture without dislocation, they are not a severe one. But if you see someone like this, anti-dislocation with GT fracture, then a reduction has to be robust and you have to maintain the greater tuberosity alignment well. Because greater tuberosity is not just a piece of bone, it's a rotator cuff attachment. So that's why you have to robustly fix this fracture and get it reduced and uh, get the mobilization quickly. You can use whichever method you want, screw fixation, anchor fixation, or you use plate fixation in this one, where you put a plate and you reduce it nicely and uh, Say again, it's another one with a 22 year old presenting after two weeks. When they present after two weeks, they cannot reduce the, by close technique. You have to go for manipulation and I have put a plate here because plate lets me to early mobilize it. You can, you can robustly reduce it and uh, you can fix it and you can mobilize it very fast. But that's the whole point of putting a plate. Sometimes I also put anchors also on top of plate. So look at this one. This patient is 58 year old sap, he has not dislocated. But if you see, GT is totally displaced. In the X-ray, you can see there is a flake of bone only. These are the candidates where you need to get good fixation. And because it's a flaky fragment, you cannot put a screw very comfortably also. You cannot put a plate there also. What you should think about is like doing an anchor type of fixation. As you can see in this one, what I've done is I've done an arthroscopic fixation. By arthroscopic fixation, I put like a double throw technique where I put two anchors in the... They're all bio anchor that you are not able to see in this one. Only what you are seeing is the nautilus anchor. This is the lateral anchor that you are seeing in the X-ray. And uh, the most important, you have to get this reduction right. If you get this reduction right, then they will not have impingement problem at all. They will heal very well. And if you see in about a few months' time, the fracture is totally united. It's totally become normal. 
and your scar you, you can see that the, uh, the scar is very low because you are putting the lateral anchor quite lower at the level of metaphyseal that's why the scar is very low this is arthroscopy fixation in few months time is fully united it has got full good good function something that is very important next point to emphasize is point 2 is tuberosities are most important for function whether it is a simple gt fracture or whether it is a complex fracture you have to emphasize on the tuberosity reduction otherwise the function of shoulder will be totally affected that is a point number 2 Now we look at this one patient who is a 70 plus gentleman. His fracture configuration is like a four part fracture, but the greater tuberosity is a big fragment, chunky fragment. LT is a small fragment. Head is tilted more in valgus, which is a good advantage for me. The head is tilted in valgus, so it is not good. But tilted in valgus, then really good. You can try and go and fix it. There will be a stable one, as you can see here. I have tried to reproduce the medial hinge very nicely. The medial hinge has to be reproduced nicely. I get anatomy reduction. Then they will heal without any problem. The age doesn't matter. If you can get this kind of reduction, then they will do very well. This patient's bone quality is also really good. So he did well. And the next gentleman, you see, a 15-year this chap, a 51-year-old, was referred to me for having a reverse shoulder replacement. But considering his age, I was not going towards reverse shoulder replacement because at the age of 51, I don't want the reverse shoulder replacement. So this guy has got a big head fragment. It's not complete, but the GT is totally displaced. LT is over here. But, uh, head is not gone into too much virus, and the medial hinge I can re-establish it if I do it correctly. So what I have done is I have put a filos plate. But the key point is here I have reduced uh, greater tuberosity with the help of the anchors. I used the uh, biobsorbable anchors to use to reduce it through the rotator, bring it through the rotator cuff, and reduce it nicely, and put a plate on top of that. This is the most important here. Reduce the greater tuberosity, and you see this screw. A screw is going towards the medial calca. It is the most important screw. And if you try to maintain that medial hinge, then the outcome will be really good. So in three months post-operative period, the fracture is almost uh, become stable, and the medial hinge is well maintained by the screw and also by reduction. And he satisfactorily reduced abducting up to more than about 120 degrees, and he's a happy chappy. So next point is point number three is try to get the medial hinge and the medial strut, medial structure important. It can be achieved by using a screw. Sometimes you have to use a buttress plate, or sometimes you can use a allograft, or sometimes you use a fibular graft to maintain the medial hinge. If you don't maintain the medial hinge, that head can go into virus collapse. So that is the next important point to remember. Now I'm going to tell about this lady. This lady is 64 year old, but physiologically she looks much older than 64 year old. Her bone is osteoporotic. It's fallen down and has got a four part fracture. It's not just uh, The four part fracture is a varus tilted fracture. See, the head is totally in varus, and it's also it's uh, dislocated also to some extent. So, if you see here, two weeks post op, his uh, uh, tuberous is nicely placed. What I've done is I've done hemiarthroplasty for her. She was done about eight or nine years back at that time, and uh, in about twelve uh, weeks time, you see the GT is resolved now. See that uh, due to the poor bone quality and also comminuted GT fracture. The bone is totally resolved, and the GT is becoming non-functional. So, uh, where is still an elderly patient, greater tuberosity comminuted, osteoporotic bone? Is it ideal for fixation? They are not. What you need to do is a replacement. Is hemiarthroplasty a good choice? It's very questionable because in 2012, which is about eight years ago, we were not doing reverse shoulder that commonly at that time, and I did that. But GT resolved. The patient is pain-free, but she is not having that function. Like not able to. Update as comfortably as possible. So point number four is age and bone quality is very important. Somebody with elderly, poor bone bone quality, the fixation may not achieve that good stability. If fixation is going to get compromised, try to think about replacement. A replacement whether it is hemi or reverse that I'll let you know in a few few more slides. So I opted for hemi for that particular patient at that time, uh, but uh, I kind of uh, retrospectively thought I should have I should have done a reverse shoulder for that because the GT resolved. It is not an uncommon situation if it is, especially in those who are having a comminuted GT fracture. The GT can get resolved. Look at this situation. Sir, uh, sorry, sir, sir, excuse me. Sorry for the interruption. Uh, sir, one small window is there in your screen, uh, downloading PR like that. Can you remove that, sir? What window? Uh, actually, one window is there uh, as downloading PR uh, errors fractures like that. 
uh, which is showing in your screen. No, it's not shown in my. <laughs> it's not seen in my uh, computer. It's not in your screen. Hmm. Uh, okay. Can you stop share and again, again uh, share your screen, sir? Sharing again? Yeah, yeah. Uh, can, can you just you stop stop sharing and yeah. Come again, back. Uh, yeah, come back again. Uh, Huh? Download. Okay. No, no, sir. No problem. Now, we, now, can you share your screen now? I'll share again, huh? Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, sorry for the interruption. Just to. Oh, sorry, sorry. How long has been going on like this? Yeah, yeah. This is almost last uh, last fifteen twenty minutes, sir. So I actually I don't want to interrupt. I, okay, now it's okay, sir. Now you can play that. Play, play. Yeah, uh, again it's coming, sir. Again it's coming. Oh. Ah, okay. uh, something is downloading, sir. Uh, yeah, yeah, just to stop uh, downloading something in your from your uh, in your laptop. And is it uh, obscuring the vision? Is it? Yeah, yeah. Now it's okay. Uh, if, if you play that full screen, no, that uh, screen is coming. Okay, I'll do one thing. Check on your desktop, sir. Desktop looks okay. Yes, yeah. Has it gone now? No. Once you go full screen, we'll come to know. Okay. Uh, Mr. Jagan, uh, in your recordings also is coming like that only, no? Yes, it is same. Is there? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so can you play, sir? Play, play now. I'll stop share and re-share again now. Okay. Okay, okay, fine. I think there was some downloading was there. I checked it. I just stopped it. Yeah, yeah, please. Is it there now? Yeah, now it's clear, sir. Now it's okay. Done. Now, oh. now it's okay. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So okay. now, uh, if you look into this scenario, somebody who is 61 year old with chronic neglected dislocation, presenting four months later with pain and inability to elevate, is an anterior dislocation, as you can see in this uh, uh, MRI pictures. The challenge in this kind of case is the chronicity. Soft tissue contracture is there. Fishy quality will be very poor. And you have to address still saccation also. I actually went and did a tried arthroscopy in this patient to do um, arthroscopic repair. But, uh, but immediate post op, I got it nicely reduced, but immediate post op within a week time, I saw it got uh, totally re dislocated. And then I had to go in for uh, doing a lethargy and also bank card repair and remplissage also. And I have done transfixing with a K wire to hold it in the joint. Kept it for about six weeks and then we started mobilizing. These are very difficult scenarios. I look into the next situation. This patient had an electric, electric shock, 57 year old, had an electric shock, had bilateral fracture dislocation, but they presented to me not immediately after some time. So it's a chronic, neglected, four part fracture with posterior dislocation. Such a kind of scenario. Here, Before these are. Stopped. Okay. Jay, somebody's uh, recording fast. Can you recording in progress? Yes, yes. Okay, fine. Yeah. So go ahead. Shall I go ahead? Oh, yes, sir. Okay. You can. You can, sir. Okay, fine. So this one is a challenge for me to see whether I should do a reverse shoulder replacement or. Um, should I do a fixation because already it's a chronic fracture? Uh, the only point against for it to doing reverse is a younger lady and it's a bilateral and it is also not affordable lady also. When you come into this kind of scenario, only thing I thought is because it's being a chunky here, I thought we'll try to go on uh, fix it. So when you are fixing this kind of fracture, you are not going to get the best outcome, but uh, at least uh, we can get some, I, I managed to get reasonable fixation in this patient. 
got like a used uh, bone substitute also bone graft there to keep the things together and they did uh, both side i did what uh, did i didn't do at the same time i did after four days one one today and then another four days later i did another one so these are the difficult challenges and if you see this one the 28 year old chap two months neglected fracture dislocation gain or fracture also and 28 year old he cannot think about replacement at all he have to go on the fixation there is no other option he already two months old has got a head over here and the glenoid is fractured so only option i had is to go and try to release everything and do fixation along with the attachy also together but these are all extreme scenarios what do you see but here if you point five for you age is an important criteria and an younger individual he cannot go on the reverse shoulder replacement because the reverse shoulder replacement we have a longevity up to about 20 years only right now i cannot do a reverse shoulder for somebody at the age of 28 and bone quality is important reducibility is important but you have to explain to these patient there is a high chance of avian and non union and uh, some patients may get away they might have avian but they may be asymptomatic avian and they may still get away and you can pull along for another few years and then you can think about replacement later stage so neglected case are always a dilemma anger is try to get it to get it fixed explaining to the patient is very very important in all these patients and now coming to the last kind of scenario where you see this patient is 3 months neglected four part proximal humerus fracture dislocation his age is 70 plus head is like a shell tubers are com- comminuted and displaced and uh, if you see this kind of scenario where this patient had 70 plus a had a fracture dislocation had it reduced and had a lateral jet done and then redislocated again so done in south africa and she came to me with reduced with dislocated uh, lateral jet procedure and only option for them is because the rotator cuff will be totally ruptured uh, there is you can't do any fixation anymore the only option for them will be a reverse shoulder replacement and if you see this kind of patient when 61 year old with acute presentation where the head is totally fragmented you can't make out the head at all here you cannot do any fixation because there is nothing to fix there the head is totally shelled out and if you see this kind of situation where it's a dislocation with tuberous is totally shattered sound is the same fracture dislocation shattered uh, proximal humerus and another situation like this where you have a proximal humerus has been totally resected because of previous disease pathology and uh, here there is no proximal humerus at all and only option for this kind of patient with 0.6 what i am trying to head is non reconstructable tuberosities are function is totally questionable and bone is osteoporotic and they are elderly only option you have is reverse shoulder replacement so what is reverse shoulder replacement see these patients where i have done reverse shoulder replacement and uh, this one with the comminuted head only option is reverse shoulder where you can try to get the gt prior gt back in phase if possible but it is not important but if you can get it much much better for it and this lady again we got reverse on the function is reasonably good you can do almost up to about uh, 110 degree abduction 100 degree abduction and this one again only option is reverse shoulder replacement and this lady with the uh, uh, failed latarge and the chronic dislocated shoulder the 70 plus lady where reverse shoulder gave a good function so the point to take is uh, reverse shoulder will be a good option for some kind of patient but just for p post graduate i want to tell what is reverse shoulder is we are trying to put the glenosphere at the place of glenoid uh, socket and humerus head it should be replaced with humeral socket the basic principle of reverse shoulder is we are trying to medialize the center of rotation and also we are trying to lengthen the deltoid by which you are going to get the function of deltoid for abduction rather than the rotator cuff so this was the basic principle of doing a reverse shoulder replacement so what is the indication for reverse shoulder is apart from non traumatic indication where it is indicated for cuff tear arthropathy or doing it for proximal humerus fracture non union proximal humerus fracture and reconstruction after tumor removal so contraindications for reverse shoulder is when there is no activity of deltoid because your reverse shoulder is going to function only with deltoid if deltoid is not there there is no point in doing a reverse shoulder at all and when there is excessive glenoid bone loss it's not a strict contraindication but you have to think about having a bone augment or bone wedges and uh, uh, um, ad- ad- additional fixation for glenoid in some cases and septic any infection is definitely contraindicated for any kind of replacement so decision making in complex proximal humerus fracture depends on what the age of the patient younger the age try to do fixation fracture pattern where it is located anatomical neck surgical neck or how the tuberosities are whether the head is split or not split and greater tuberosity whether it is reconstructable or not reconstructable and then what about the medial hinge how how the type of reduction that we can virus neutral or valgus valgus is better virus is always a bad thing to have 
So the goal to achieve in a fixation is neutral or valgus reduction, establish a medial hinge, tuberosity should be well approximated, get rigid fixation with plate, not to disrupt superficial envelope very much. When you are dissecting for uh, fixation, try not to dissect out too much soft tissue because some periosteal envelope is always needed for newborn formation. And use bone graft if needed like fibula strut graft or a medial calcar graft can be used and get a good fixation in the type of plate fixation. If we can't achieve all these things, our poor bone quality is there, then reverse should be the option. So that's it, I conclude my talk. Thank you very much for listening. So let's look for, uh, I think I finished with the indication for reverse shoulder, so that uh, next speech will be on more on reverse shoulder itself. That's why I finished with the indication. So if there are any questions in the chat box, we can discuss there. Otherwise, we we'll finish the next talk, and then we can go for the discussion if there are anything. So you want me to take over now? Is that okay to present my... Presentation. Yeah. So let's. Uh, I will go on on the stop share mode. Uh, uh, Dr. Anthony Van Ruybroek can uh, go on to the share screen mode. I can start your presentation. Those who are not there during the initial uh, introduction, I just want to inform uh, Dr. Toon Van Ruybroek is a president of the Shoulder Elbow Society in Belgium, and is a very popular shoulder surgeon over there, and he is uh, attached to. Ortho clinic in uh, uh, Nicholas Charlotten, Saint Nicholas in uh, Lisel Rock near Antwerp in Belgium. Uh, Dr. Toon, you are welcome to start your presentation. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you very much for the invitation. I hope you can hear me uh, nice and clearly here from Belgium and you can see my slides. So thanks for the invitation. Uh, today I just wanted to share you our experiences with, uh, with the total shoulder. Uh, reverse for acute fractures. We have in, in Europe, we've got a quite a big history of the reverse. Our neighbor uh, in France, uh, Dr. Gramont, is actually the inventor of the reverse total shoulder. So uh, we've got a big history of uh, this replacement. And it was actually al already in 85 that uh, Dr. Gramont presented his first results with the reverse prosthesis. At that time, it was in the Journal of Rheumatology, it was not, wasn't even orthopedics. Uh, but it was in the Journal of Rheumatology. And it was in 93 that the first presentation in an orthopedic uh, pa paper appeared uh, on its results for arthrosis of the shoulder with rotator cuff tears. So we go all the way back with this reverse total shoulder. Um, and actually it, it, it meant a new, a new development in the story of our orthopedics. It was a new era. Uh, for the treatment of cuff tear arthropathy for massive cuff tears. And uh, at the end, we actually tried the same uh, uh, surgery uh, for complex fractures. And now these days we're changing even patient age, uh, even uh, primary osteoarthrosis with B2 glenoids. So we're changing uh, our indication, but this is beyond the topic of, uh, of what we're uh, talking about today. Um, in fact, it... Uh, uh, as an introduction, I wanted to show this uh, result of a big French study from the French uh, Shoulder Society, and it's it's a, a present it's, it's a paper from many many years ago with a big uh, case series of uh, 450 patients, and actually in the beginning we had quite a big complication rate. Even in the primary arthroplasty, we had 15% complication rate, as you can see here in the bottom. So even for primary, the complication rate was quite high. Uh, this just as a small introduction. Um, and next part of the introduction was actually a, a survey that we did amongst the, the Belgian Shoulder and Elbow Societies and our members. And we sent a few cases around with some uh, x-rays, some CT scans. And we discussed actually the way that we could uh, treat these patients and one of the cases was this uh, patient, 75 year old, with an acute fracture. As you can see, it's a four part fracture with a split of the greater tuberosity at the same time. 
So at that time, it's five years ago, uh, Belgian surgeons, they would treat this patient almost in 90% of the surgeons with a reverse total shoulder arthroplasty. Um, it becomes a bit more difficult in the same survey. If you would state that this patient wasn't 75 or 60 years old, then treatment was completely changing to plate and screw fixation. So a uh, conclusion at that time was that age, as you mentioned already before in the previous talk, that age is very important in making the decision uh, of the treatment of this type of fractures. So age is very decisive. And also the aim of the surgery is quite important. Uh, for us, the aim, if we choose for surgery in this type of fractures, and the aim of the surgery is at the end, a shoulder with good pain control. I think that's most important after these complex fractures that we can complain and that we can uh, control the pain at the end of the treatment. Of course, secondly important is that we want a low complication rate uh, so that it's maybe just one treatment without any complications. And finally, if we can get a good function, of course, the better the function, the better the result and the more happy that we are. But first of all, we got the pain control. We want few complications and we want to have as good as function as possible. So having said that as an introduction, uh, five years ago, we made a conclusion that age, of course, it's a physiological thing, but age anyway is very important. So we've seen in the previous talk, a lot of reconstruction and, and we want to encourage that. I think reconstruction in younger patient is absolutely the first choice. It's necessary, it's mandatory. So we could state that underneath the age of 60, which of course is kind of physiological, uh, plate and screw reconstruction is absolutely uh, the treatment of choice. Above 70, we got more the, uh, uh, the aim for a reverse total shoulder. As above 70, uh, the function and the quality of the bone, the quality of the pieces, the quality of the rotator cuff attaching to those pieces diminishes. And of course, the result even functionally might be better with a reverse total shoulder as we're replacing the rotator cuff in this construction, which is biomechanically completely different as the reconstruction, of course. So just to illustrate actually that mid portion of the patients in between 60 and 70 years of, of age, I think it's physiological and you need to look at the patient itself. I mentioned again in the previous talk, it's very important to discuss with your patient and, and see what type of patient you have. This is a 66 year old patient that's very, very active. And even in this very complex cases, where we see a complete luxation of the humeral head posteriorly uh, in the x-ray on the right side. If it's a very active patient, we should go for reconstruction. And we've seen a, a few very nice reconstructions in the previous talk. This is, I think, a nice reconstruction that we did as well. So even if it's displaced, even if it's uh, a very complicated, if patient's active and young, treatment with reconstruction and plate and screw fixation should be choice number one for sure. Um, there was a small mention of hemiarthroplasty. We abandoned almost completely uh, hemiarthroplasty for fracture in Belgium. Um, our results uh, trying to get those two varsities healed aren't very good. So we put everything on reconstruction um, and try to avoid hemiarthroplasties. Having said that, we would like to present our results of the reverse total shoulders that we did. And we looked actually at the complication rate of our reverse total shoulders uh, primary for osteoarthritis and uh, reverse total shoulder for fracture. And as you can see, we had quite a big amount of, uh, of patients. And actually the complication rate, if we looked at the primary and the reverse for fracture, was quite the same. Uh, we had few infections, luckily, very few instability, even in fracture instability doesn't seem to be any problem. Uh, and initially, the first years, we had quite a few stress fractures after the reverse total shoulder, but only in primary series, not in reverse total shoulder for fracture. So if you look at the pro procedures, we had 280 reverse total shoulder primary and 160 uh, for fracture, and the complication rate for fracture was actually lower uh, than the complication rate for the reverse total shoulder primary. Um, and extra in the second uh, uh, file, you can see that the complication rate, if you use a reverse total shoulder after failed osteosynthesis, 
but the complication rate is very low as well. So if the reconstruction doesn't work, uh, uh, reverse topo shoulder is still a good solution, of course, uh, if avoidable, please do avoid it. But if the reconstruction fails completely, we can put a hemi, uh, a reverse thing without a lot of problems. What is the technique that we're using? Uh, quite special. We don't use any tuberosity fixation. So we cut it out all tuberosity, lesser tuberosity, greater tuberosity. We removed everything. We use a cemented stem. We use antibiotics and a drain and sling for six weeks. Now it's three weeks. And physio rehab starts at three weeks uh, postoperatively. So maybe surprising, no tuberosity refixation. Uh, we are uh, we are sure that we don't need the tuberosities for stability. Um, in those patients where we choose for a reverse, the quality of the cuff and the tendons is very bad. It's very elderly patients, very poor bone, very poor tendon quality. So not all the function of the rotator cuff. And anyway, for by biomechanical reasons. In reverse total shoulder, we don't need any subscapularis or supraspinatus. So refixation of lesser, tuberos lesser tuberosity is never indicated. And maybe you, we can discuss about the greater tuberosity, as of course, infraspinatus may improve function and may improve external rotation. But big problem is if you do a refixation, but you've got a malunion of the greater tuberosity, it is definitely a reason for instability of your construct with a higher complication rate. And if you don't use any refixation, you've got a, start, a faster start of the rehab. So how about external rotation? If you cut everything out, uh, it's not too bad. And the new designs of the reverse total shoulder with a, a lot more lateralization, they can get a lot of uh, external rotation even without infraspinatus function. So just a few examples of what we do. You can see here on the top right that we cut everything out. There is no tuberosities left anymore. On the bottom, complex fracture left side, we treated it on the right side. In this case, very exceptionally. Um, no, 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 I'm, 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 I'm mistaken now. It's, it's, the, it's the drain, still in, uh, it's just still in. So we cut everything out, all tuberosities are gone, and we just put a reversed in cemented stem um, with good clinical outcomes and a very low complication rate. Another example on the left side, on the top, complicated uh, fracture in an elderly lady. We cut all uh, tuberosities out and we put in the reversed prosthesis. At the bottom, uh, a revision after a failed osteosynthesis. Again, removal of all greater tuberosity and lesser tuberosity. A failed plate and screw osteosynthesis with a revision. Uh, to the reverse, on top, same at the bottom, just to show you a few uh, of our cases as an example, technically. So in conclusion, after we looked at this and we saw the complication rate, uh, we were convinced that reverse total shoulder is a very good treatment for acute three to four part fractures uh, within, of course, our indications, meaning elderly patients, low demanding, bad quality, of course, everything that we heard in the previous talk we can copy to the indications of our reverse total shoulder. Uh, we can get a very good pain control. These patients are very happy. We've got a very low complication rate. Um, the only thing now after five years after our previous results, maybe one thing that we are changing is in fact that people beyond in between 60 and 70 with very poor uh, bone quality, they get more and more active. Um, so from time to time these days, we consider refixating the greater tuberosity with only infraspinatus connected. So we resect supraspinatus, very important. Uh, and even if you want to improve the external rotation, you can just do a lattice miss dorsi transfer, uh, which is technically easier than trying to refix all tuberosities around the prosthesis. So uh, an example of last month, actually a complicated uh, case for part. Uh, on X-ray and CT scan. And in this case, we did a nice reduction of the greater tuberosity uh, in hope that the function at the end, as it was quite active, uh, 75, will improve the function. So having done this, we hope that we can keep the pain control uh, with the results uh, that we had uh, in our previous series from five years ago. We hope that we can keep the complication rate as low as it was then, but maybe we can improve slightly the function for those intermediate group 
where we still got very active patients above 65 or 70 years um, with very poor bone quality on the other hand. So this was actually the thing that I wanted to share, our results and our experience with the reverse total shoulder for acute fractures in three to four part uh, fractures. So thank you very much again for the invitation and I hope uh, I could help you with some of these uh, complex traumatic problems. Thank you again for the invitation. Tony, it was excellent talk. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was very good talk. Um, let's see from the chat box, are there any... questions in that? Just I want to ask you something. What is your experience sure. on um, uh, doing uh, revision reverse for those who are failed reverse? Like using long stem and all. Well, the, the only revisions probably that we do, the problem is the glenoid side. You know, the stem side is very, it's very rare that the stem side is a problem. So long stems in revision, it's very rare. It happens maybe in fractures around the reverse total shoulder but the stem is almost never a problem. So if there's a problem, it's the glenoid side uh, with loosening maybe after infection. And what we do in the most of those cases, we, we, we transfer the, the reverse total shoulder to a hemi. So we just take the construct out, we place some grafts onto the glenoid and we put a big, big ball uh, instead. So we reconverse it, not uh, reverse to reverse, but most of the times reverse to a hemi. And it's always in elderly people, lowly momming people. So they're happy that the pain is gone at that, uh, using that technique. So again, their pain control is, is most important. And in revision, mostly we would go to, to a hemi. Yeah. What is the kind of longest outcome that we have now? Oh, we, we, we're very far. We're using 25 years, the reverse total shoulder. So yeah. Yeah, I know. I know. Yeah, so it's 20, right, yeah. At, at least twenty-five years in the big in the big series. Uh, my own series, of course, as I'm working now, seventeen years. My own series is seventeen years. Uh, but in, in Europe, you've got big big experience, twenty-five. And and the, it's it's very rare, to be honest. We it's very rare to do a revision of a reverse total shoulder. I I can really state that a reverse total shoulder is 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 a definitive solution if there is no. Uh, complication as kind of infections, things like that. If there's no infection, actually, I think, and no fracture after a fall, I think the reverse is, is, is a definitive solution of the problem. So revision is very, very rare, to be honest. Uh, just uh, a very quick question about, uh, uh, you know, uh, the patients you have done some 20 years ago, and uh, uh, the one that you're doing the recent years, uh, have you changed the technique very much or uh, you're using a similar technique? And uh, do you, have you seen any difference in outcome from the early ages and now? Obviously, would you improved much, isn't it? Now? Or no, is the same? No, no, no. We, we're changing a bit the, the, the construction of the prosthesis. So we're changing with angulation. Uh, what we changed is that we put the glenoid sphere a lot more inferior. So we try to avoid notching. So probably if you have a look at the x-rays, our glenosphere like now are five or six millimeters lower than it was before. And that's probably the big trick. Initially, we put it, the glenoid in a reverse as we did uh, the same glenoid for an anatomical. And that was a mistake. So now we're putting the glenoid head really downwards. So the lowest part of the base plate of the glenoid should be at the lower part of the glenoid itself. And that way, with that shift inferiorly, we avoid almost any problems of uh, 
like notching and things like that. That's really solved by just adjusting the technique and putting the glenoid completely inferior. As you could see at my x-rays, the final x-ray, for example, uh, the, the hemisphere uh, at the glenoid side is quite low. And that's the big trick that we changed probably the past 20 years. There are a couple of questions in the chat box. One is uh, they're asking any role of careful neglect and start with active movement when plane subsides. Have you ever tried it? Careful neglect. Uh, I think the case of like what they are asking is uh, uh, maybe somebody the fracture dislocation. Yeah, of course. Well, well, what we're talking about is is when you've made the decision already for surgery. You know, the decision for surgery that's something completely different. So, uh, if any doubt, choose uh, conservative treatment for sure, and and look at the pain. The pain management is in these cases, in all fracture cases, is pain management the main goal. So if you got a complex fracture, but the patient is happy with not the, not too much pain, of course, conservative treatment is the first choice. Obviously, sure. I think it's all depend. It all yeah, depends so, on patient symptom. They are highly yeah. symptomatic, then you have to do something about it. If they are uh, not having that much pain, then it, that's also one option to think about. Sure, sure. And there is pain one control should be first uh, point of concern. Yeah. As one question on lateral offset, how much lateral offset is ideal in order to avoid impingement? Well, it's not lateral offset, it's inferior uh, shift. It's not lateral offset for impingement. So, so to avoid the impingement, of course, if you've got a big ball, it's going to be easier if you've got some lateralization as well, maybe even some inclination, but that's not the most important. The most important is the shift inferiorly. If you put the, the metaglen uh, as inferior as possible, there's not going to be any uh, notching. So it's, it's not the lateralization which is important to avoid uh, notching, it's the inferior shift which is important. And uh, there's a question on superior lateral or deltopectoral approach. Yeah. I commonly do deltopectoral approach because that's what I got trained. And uh, yeah, what is your me. difference? Same with me. I'm, I'm sparing deltoid. Deltoid is so important in those cases. So I would never touch deltoid, even not with a split. So I would always go deltopectoral approach for sure. So try don't oh, yeah. not to harm the deltoid. So I wouldn't I wouldn't make a split in the deltoid. We we prefer deltopectoral approach for sure. And that's main and another yeah. important thing mainly because we want to have deltoid as fully functional. Mm. We don't want to disrupt the deltoid muscle at all. So we want to go deltopectoral approach. Yeah. Mm. And there is one question on can you explain how subscapularis and supraspinatus is not biomechanically needed in RTSA? I think they are asking a basic principle of uh, RTSA. Yeah, well, you know, that, that's a, a completely different topic, you know, it, it's a completely different biomechanics. So yes, I would yeah. love to present another presentation with the biomechanics of reverse, but that's definitely behind this topic of the fracture. It's a, it's a completely different biomechanical construct, uh, but that's... So, that's I mean, I will just simply so tell I, for I, the uh, audience, uh, we are relying on the deltoid fully. So yeah. deltoid is going to perform the function of uh, abduction, not the supraspinatus. So the whole... Criteria of being a reverse shoulder is that um, uh, in the absence of rotator cuff, you are trying to substitute the function of rotator cuff with the help of the uh, deltoid. So that's why we indirectly say that it's supraspinatus and subscapular it may not be that much needed biomechanically in RTSA. Okay. Obviously, it is a very big topic to discuss about. It is a simple concept, this is what it is. Okay. I'm, I'm running a bit. I'm, I'm running a bit late here. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm, I'm gonna have to head over to. I think uh, uh, we are coming game. to the end of the session anyway. We, so if there's not uh, because... a big burning question, I, I think if that's all right with you, I'm gonna leave you guys here and and head on Fine. to my next. Fine. Fine. I think uh, we are also done here. Thank you. Thank you for participating okay. with us, and uh, it was a useful of session course. for us. Thank you, Tom. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hope Thank to you. meet you soon. Bye bye, guys. Cheers. Sure, 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 sure. Ciao. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I think uh, we're coming to the conclusion of the meeting, Ramesh. Yeah. Yeah. Recording yes, stopped. We're coming to the conclusion of the meeting. And uh, yeah. Thank you very much for all the participants for. Uh, Sir, sir, uh, can you, either, you, sir, you can you unmute one, one instrument. Either you unmute laptop or... La
So you can, yeah, yeah. Now you can speak. Yes, yes. So uh, with this, uh, we are coming to the. I think there are no more questions as you can see in the chat box. We are coming to the end of the session. Mm, it was uh, very nice to have this session. I thank uh, Olympic Pharmaceutical to support us for this event, and uh, I thank all the uh, participants who are in this meeting and. Uh, it can be watched in the Ortho TV and also in the YouTube at later on at any point. So please make use of that. And we'll be meeting again next month for another topic of interest. So thank you everyone for participating. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll leave the meeting. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Yes, you can, you can uh, give an end, end on it. Yeah, we want to thank Ortho TV also, which is uh, helping us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok, and thank you, Jagan. Huh?